Hare Krishna. Question from Stephen. Does religion cause sexual repression? Does it make people give a, 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 a drives that are actually natural to them? Answer. What religion asks for is not sexual repression, but sexual regulation. And regulation is necessary even for basic civilized human conduct. Even if one does not believe in um, believe in God, you know, even materialists and atheists who uh, may openly reject uh, God and say that we should have sexual freedom, they also recognize. They will also admit that sexual freedom does not warranty or uh, does not allow just indulging in any and every sexual impulse. For example, almost everyone uh, would shudder at the idea of sexual abuse of children. And same way, most civilized people would, uh, would strongly oppose the idea of forcible sex even upon uh, people who are not uh, people who are uh, uh, not children, people who are elder also. So rape, uh, so, so for example child abuse, child sexual abuse and rape are strongly disapproved even by people who are uh, people who are in favor of sexual freedom. So the point is now this also is some form of regulation. Of course it's the most uh, basic form of regulation but the point is that if we say that because religion asks us to regulate the sexual urge then religion is not alone and that because of that it is repressive then religion is not alone in asking us for regulating sexual urge even basic uh, civilized conduct even materialists and atheists uh, they will also expect some basic level of regulation of sex so now the question comes up what level of regulation constitutes repression? So today's standard, especially with the spread of materialism and atheism, is just consent. So the idea that people should have uh, sex only after they are married, only within marriage, this many people, uh, this some people consider to be repressive. Uh, so premarital and extramarital sex are often glamorized in today's media and they are considered as forms of sexual freedom. So is not allowing that or is disapproving that form of sexual repression? We have to look at things objectively, not just the word freedom. When say, we talk about freedom or ex sexual exp expression, these are words which are meant to emotionally attract people and thereby make them, uh, make them immediately receptive to certain ideas. If we look at society, uh, the way human society is constituted, and not just human society, let's look at broad nature. The way nature is constituted, almost always the act of copulation is connected with the act of reproduction. So yes, most species may not unite uh, with the specific intention of reproduction, but nor do they unite with the specific intention of avoiding reproduction by some artificial means. So that is a result that nature has intrinsically uh, tied together with. Uh, so body union and body union and bodily reproduction go together. So now in human society, if we see, we humans alone try to stop this by artificial means. But the, uh, and often that leads to abortion, which is very sinful, which involves just the murder of the unborn child, uh, no matter how it is dressed and marketed. And further, we see that throughout the history of the world, societies where uh, marriages have been trivialized have collapsed. You know, the Roman Empire at one time was ruling a large part of the world. And historians almost universally admit that one of the uh, reasons why the Roman Empire collapsed was the 
or sexual pro sec prom increasing incidences of sexual promiscuity and overall immorality in society. So, the family is the basic unit of society, and sexual uh, fidelity, chastity within marriage between for the both both the spouses. That is what uh, key. Uh, that is what is vital for the marriage bond to be strong. So, when that is not, uh, when that is abandoned in the name of uh, sexual freedom or uh, not having sexual repression, then the end result is the family becomes family bond becomes weakened. And then, uh, if we compare, so oh, I talk about two distinct reasons. One is that other when there is premarital extramarital sex then unnaturally we have to people have to separate copulation and reproduction and further we talk about stabilizing stability of society and stability of family that is there when there is a proper sexual faithfulness and when people have some relationship before marriage then the spouse is always wondering if this person was not faithful May, uh, was not uh, not self-regulated enough in the past. What is the guarantee that after marriage the person will be self-regulated, and that creates a uh, doubt. And if there are extramarital relationships, then further the relationship becomes weakened. And then beyond that, uh, somebody may say that oh, but there's no need for this regulation at all. Even marriage is not required. And the question comes up here. We have to look at. Uh, the difference between human life and spiritual, uh, human life and animal life. Humans not only have a potential for spirituality, which differentiates them from animals, we have a longing for happiness, which uh, just uh, sexuality cannot satisfy, because sexuality can offer us at least, uh, at best, a few moments of pleasure. And all the more, when the relationship, when there is unregulated, when there is no regulation in the relationship, then sex becomes just basically a bodily act for gaining bodily release and pleasure. And that lasts at best for a few moments. Now when there is, uh, <coughs> when, when the, uh, and that can never satisfy our longing for happiness, no matter how much uh, the, uh, bodily act is glamorized it is actually uh, it is actually very uh, trivial in terms of the amount of time it can offer any pleasure as compared with the amount of craving and the torture of the torment of uh, the unfulfilled craving is there so the media may glamorize with the images of unending erotic pleasure but that is simply a myth it's simply a phantasmagoria the body's capacity is inescapably limited. So, when there is no regulation, then all that happens is that there is the uh, the uh, the perpetual dissatisfaction that comes because there is no satis the, the the craving is not satisfied. The craving is not satisfied, and and the end result that so called we have sexual repression on one side, and then we say that we have sexual liberation. But if you look at society today, sexual liberation simply led to sexual perversion. By sexual perversion, I mean that if we just compare historically uh, as this and the uh, incidence of violence against women, violent assaults, uh, rapes, and the incidence of child abuse, and uh, overall uh, sexual violence that is there, that is far, far more than what it has been there in the past. And the uh, extent to which it is increasing is also alarming, to say the very least. So, what? Uh, so, in the name of sexual liberation, we are ending up with sexual perversion. The extent. Uh, now, I'm not using perversion again in a religious, moralistic sense. I'm talking about it even from the humanistic sense, where people say that, oh, if any sex is cons consensual, that is not perverse. But even from that perspective, there is so much for sex that is happening as I said the rapes are becoming so many uh, so widespread and further there is also child abuse that is happening so sexual perversion even from humanistic standards what to speak of religious standards that is the end result why because the desires the cravings are not satisfied and the desires are not satisfied one becomes more and more maddened by those desires and people end up doing things 
which are unconscionable which are horrendous and that's how it's like a slippery slope there is sexual regulation which is talked about by religion once one uh, is one says no there's no need for this level of regulation we are opening the floodgates for immorality and then the flood comes out the immoral desires start pushing the person down 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 and that ends so the once the floodgates are opened what is and then uh, what is called as sexual liberation ends up uh, at the bottom of a dirty cesspool of sexual perversion so uh, now the uh, uh, the further point here is that when we talk about sexual regulation when a man and a woman are married and when they live together at that time there is a not just a physical bond but also emotional bond a relationship is formed and that relationship is something which is lasting and that takes the focus uh, over a period of time of just the physical aspect and there is a when and this is for this forming of a broad relationship can happen only when uh, there is commitment from both sides and the whole idea of sexual liberation removes the idea removes uh, the whole concept of commitment and uh, on this website there is an article made for each other and there are uh, the harvard um, a harvard university sociological study was done among young people who were living uh, these, la these sexually liberated lives and basically despite the show of uh, living like uh, movie stars uh, having all kind of enjoyment when they were interviewed closely basically they all admitted that they felt extremely lonely and guilty lonely because they had no relation they had no deep relationship with anyone they knew in their heart of heart that they were basically using other people and this was for both boys and girls, males and females, both. And they were using other people for their own pleasure and they were similarly being used by that. And the guilty feelings that they were having was not just because of some hangover of some religious indoctrination from the past. You know, it, they just felt guilty at a human level because they were using others. And many of these children had not come from religious background. So there was no question of religious indoctrination. So from even from a human point of view, the idea of sexual uh, uh, sexual liberation and uh, and calling sexual regulation a sexual repression what is the result of that that is at a psychological level there's loneliness there is guilt there is no there are no meaningful relationships that are there in people so uh, further if we see as contrast now what is natural in nature is not always the same everywhere somebody might argue that animals don't have marriages that may be true but then humans uh, also have some differences. Animals don't cook and eat their food. Humans eat, cook and eat their food. And we see that as compared to other species where the children grow up relatively quickly. The humans are the only, humans are relatively the exception where the young ones are extremely dependent on the children and they're dependent on their parents and they're dependent for a significantly longer time uh, than most other species and and this dependence is not just uh, physical but it is also moral the moral I mean that animals basically live by their in instincts and uh, the by, they basically learn by their instincts how to eat how to sleep how to mate how to survive how to defend themselves but uh, while we humans do all these things you know, it, an important duty of parents is also to imbue with, if, of human parents, is to imbue within their children a sense of morality. That this is right and this is wrong. You know, we are also driven by our instincts, but we are not driven only by our instincts. You know, we have a conscience. And this is our conscience that actually differentiates us from animals. And this conscience enables us to think of not just higher spiritual truths, but of higher even material principles and to live in a way that we can develop our potential. You know, student, children may like to play, but parents have to tell the children, okay, your instinct may be to play, but regulate it. Use your intelligence and study. Then you will have a bright career. 
So same way that just as there have to be choices made between lower and higher things at a material level, similarly there are choices between uh, lower material things and higher spiritual things. So this all involves morality. So it is the parents who have to give education and morality to children. And again this is something which differentiates humans from animals. So now this sort of education, uh, of this sort of taking care of the children is best possible when there is a committed relationship and both parents are there. You know, if there is only one, one parent, a single mother or in some cases a single father, then the responsibility of shaping the children becomes, uh, becomes crushing. It's not possible to, uh, to let, get the children to go properly without the, both the parents being there. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult. So the point again is, if we look at it from a broad sociological perspective, then also in most societies where the children do not come up in, in grow in healthy families, where the, both the parents are there, then it is a sad fact that the children often grow up to be, grow up to be juvenile delinquents, they often get into bad habits drugs and premature sexual environment and depression and loneliness and then eventually even suicidal urges. So uh, there are many sociological surveys, the book God the Evidence by Patrick Glenn gives my evidences especially compiled from various sources. This is one of the strongest correlator of a healthy, of a, of say youth depression or youth suicide is whether a person has come from a stable family in childhood or not whether the children have been loved or not. So again, all this will not be possible if the, um, if the parents are instead of, instead of being committed to each other and committed to the child, if the parents are constantly hunting for uh, new partners for sexual escapades, then there will be no uh, taking care and nurturing and growing of the population and the future of humanity will be very bleak. So this so-called sexual liberation will actually lead to uh, human degradation. Again, not in a degradation in a religious sense alone, but even in a human sense, our, who will take care of the future races. So there is sexual re regulation that is there. So at one level it is marriage. And that's what primarily the religions of the world ask uh, talk about. They recommend that. Uh, sexuality be, redu uh, be regulated to the marriage relationship and that is not repression that is actually channelization it enables the human energy to be constructively channelized in various ways firstly it, uh, it, it maintains social order by not going around in uh, violent destructive perverse direction secondly it maintains social order further by ensuring that the next generation is taken care of properly then it helps people to develop a stable relationship with a life partner a relationship which is not just physical but also expands to an all-round relationship and most importantly considering that we are at our core spiritual beings the regulation of the sexual drive enables the human energy to be shifted from sex to, spirit, to, to higher spiritual pursuits and it helps people to eventually learn to mm, love God and find, uh, uh, find far greater and richer happiness in that than what can ever be provided by any form of sexual liberation. Thank you. Hare Krishna.